Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christy Tice. I am an assistant professor in the division, Department of Pediatrics um, in the Division of Medical Genetics, and it is very much my honor to be moderating today's important session on omics in maternal and child health. I hope everyone is very caffeinated. I know this is the last session of the day, but I think we saved the best for last, in my opinion. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Chuck Guad. He is an associate professor of pediatrics in hematology and oncology. His lab works at the interface of biotech, computational biology, cellular biology, and clinical med medicine to develop and apply new tools for characterizing genetic variation across single cells within a tissue. And his talk today is titled, Studying Tissue Mosaicism and Evolution with Primary Templates Directed Amplification. Take it away. All right, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, and so uh, thanks a lot for the invitation as well to present some of our latest work. Um, and so we, uh, so uh, just quickly I have a disclosure that I'm gonna talk about a technology which we have commercialized um, and I'm a, a co-founder of the company. Um, but I'd like to start this talk kind of at a very high-level view um, and really kind of step back and ask, you know, where have we come with ge human genetics over the last, you know, two or three decades? And if you look at inherited diseases as you go down, you can see the massive number and increase of single gene-associated diseases that we've identified, um, which was really driven by the development of, of next-generation sequencing technologies. Um, and similarly, you can see um, disease predisposition. So doing GWAS studies and finding uh, mutations that predispose to disease have also uh, rapidly expanded. And so uh, the question I've had, or at least a few years ago had, is really what are the next frontiers? And so you know, some people have argued we're learning most of what we can learn by just sequencing large populations. There's not much more to learn. Um, but I would argue that there is still a lot to learn about studying intra-tissue genetic diversity. And so <clears throat> just to give you some numbers to kind of try and put things into context, um, so we're composed of about 37 trillion cells. To get there, required trillions of cell divisions. Um, we, we acquire a copying error that's not repaired about once every cell division. Um, and then we continue acquiring mutations as we age, um, as well as uh, from copying errors, as well as mutagen exposure. Um, and as an oncologist, I see this as really exemplified by cancer, um, where we again go from a single cell to hundreds of billions of cells, um, and they typically have an impaired ability to uh, repair uh, mutations and er other errors. And so most of what we've learned um, from sequencing has been at the tissue level using bulk sequencing. Um, but there are some limitations for trying to study this intertissue genetic diversity using bulk sequencing. So first, um, we're sequencing thousands of cells mixed together. So even detecting these rare heterogeneous populations and looking at things like mutation rate per cell or number of mutations per cell um, is extremely challenging. Um, we can't deconvolute other cell-specific processes such as you know, whether mutation co-segregates with another mutation or some other biomolecule in the cell, so with a transcriptional profile, um, an epigenetic profile, or, or anything else. Um, and then again, we can't uh, determine really what we want to know is perturbed cell states. And that's a combination of changes in the genome, changes in the transcriptome, the epigenome, um, and uh, other things uh, that are being discovered. And so uh, really to get to single cell, uh, there are a, number, a couple ways to do it. The most kind of low-tech way to do it um, that other groups have done um, is to take um, tissues and then uh, sort individual cells into wells. Um, and then uh, wait a month or two for those to grow to enough cells and then do sequencing. And so this is obviously very laborious. You're selecting for a subset of cells, um, but you do get accurate numbers. And so <clears throat> if you look at the equation here, um, each of us, the best estimate we have now when we're born um, at the y-intercept here, we have about 100 mutations in each hematopoietic stem cell. Um, and then other cell types like memory B cells who have um, active somatic uh, hypermutation um, leads to increase where actually the, the cells are born without a, about a thousand uh, mutations per cell. And most of those aren't shared across cells. So every cell's got a unique uh, uh, complement of mutations and then you multiply that across billions of cells. And so uh, when I was a postdoc here, um, I really thought a lot about how, how is there a better way to get at this? And so 
uh, the way I kind of think at it and break it down is there's really two problems. So one is um, increasing automation and how you isolate and manipulate cells. Um, and the other is the biochemistry. <clears throat> and so there are a number of ways um, that have advanced for, uh, provided advancements for isolating, manipulating cells, um, which isn't my area of expertise, but we've really focused on the biochemistry. Um, and so, you know, the, the, when I was a postdoc, we really, an early, early faculty member really was frustrated by the poor quality of the data that we got. Um, and so the main issue was a lack of uniformity or coverage um, that would in, impair your ability to detect mutations and, and introduce false positives. There were all sorts of issues with reproducibility. And so we just thought about ways in which we could improve that. And so just to give you a, com uh, a quick uh, schematic of what we did, a really kind of simple solution, um, and just to give you a little bit of background of the biochemistry, so the kind of gold standard for a long time has been a method called MDA, um, which was invented about 20 years ago. Um, and it involves random priming, a special polymerase, 529, um, which is very processive, so it goes on for a long time. It can displace the strand in front of it. It also has a very low error rate, um, and so it doesn't produce many errors when copying. But the issue is that wherever it starts, you get this kind of jackpotting effect where you get a lot of amplification in that region, but less in, in neighboring regions that were primed later. And so the thought was, what if we can control the kinetics of the reaction? So what uh, if we take a, a, a advantage of the strand displacement, the low error rate, um, but we don't let it be so processive so that we can let priming occur in other areas. Um, and so in theory, that would lead to the smaller amplicons that cover the genome um, in a more uniform manner. And so if you look over time at the amount of DNA we yield, this is MDA and this is MDA with no template. So it just starts making a bunch of DNA after a couple hours, even though there's no template there. Um, with PTA, you could see the reaction was slower to take off, um, but if you look at the slope of the line, it's much more linear um, than, than this slope. Um, and so that looked promising. <clears throat> and then we looked at the coverage of the genome, so increasing sequencing, fraction of the genome covered. So this is all, the entire genome here. Um, these are bulk samples here, and so you can see with PTA, uh, we're covering in each cell almost the entire same amount of the genome as we would cover in a bulk sample. Um, and so this is what the uniformity looks like. Again, this is MDA. You can see going across chromosome one, you can see all these jackpotting events. Um, you see loss of coverage at the centromere due to the, the GC content. Um, and PTA, it's not perfectly uniform, but you see, uh, again, the loss at the centromere, but you don't see these big peaks and valleys, and so much more uniform coverage. Um, and that enables us, if you look at increasing sequencing, and sensitivity of, of all the variants across the entire genome. Um, with PTA, we're detecting about 90%, and the next best is you know, in the 60s to 70s. Um, and then precision, we were as good as uh, similar precision to MDA, and we've, we've subsequently done, uh, made improvements to the protocol to increase the precision further. And then the last kind of technical feature um, is that uh, with PTA, we actually, the slowing down of the reaction allows smaller templates to amplify uh, and more efficiently relevant to, to the, the autosomes. And so we get, with the same amount of sequencing, just a few million reads, really high, high coverage of the mitochondrial genome uh, compared to MDA, so chiogen MDA here. And so the question is, how can we use this to study this intratissue genetic variation? Um, and so the first area we've worked on uh, when I first came back to Stanford I was asking, can we develop a better pre-implantation genetic test? And so people take a small number of cells and then amplify the DNA from that, um, and then do um, genetic screening for, for serious genetic diseases. And I'm not gonna show much data, but the short answer is that, um, again, looking at coverage of the genome very uniformly, when we get four or five cells in there, we can cover most of the genome, we can detect you know, about 95% of all the variants across the genome um, with, with high precision. Um, and so the question we've asked is now is can we create a pre-implantation genetic test that will accurately identify all known mutations um, that result in early childhood mortality? And so we've actually have now hundreds of kids being born um, every month who use a test based on our amplification, which is, is rapidly um, ramping up over the next couple of years. When we take the next step forward and we look at um, going from embryo to early development, all the mutations acquired during aging, uh, when I was postdoc, worked with uh, Steve and Ewan Ashley. 
um, and more recently have, have worked with uh, Kristen and Joyce and uh, Jerry um, and Ali um, looking at different types of tissues and, and investigating the roles of somatic mutations in um, things like vascular malformations, lung malformations, brain malformations. Um, and so just in the interest of time, I'll just briefly talk about uh, where we've gotten with the project with Jerry and now Wes has just come over from uh, Chris Walsh's lab at Harvard um, has started here and essentially Jerry came to us and said, I have these patients with cortical dysplasia that have horrible seizures. Um, I put these probes in to monitor them for epilepsy and when I take the probes out, I just throw them away. Would you be able to get some neurons from there to sequence them and see if they're actually somatic mutations mediating um, those uh, uh, malformations. And so this is an example of a patient. You can see the probes. Many of them are very deep uh, and very deep structures. Um, and then new N is a marker for neuronal nuclei. So you can see we're sorting single nuclei here. Um, and so we then uh, use PTA and sequence those. Um, this happened to be a patient with tuberous sclerosis. Um, and so we were able to identify the, the known mutation. Interestingly, we did find uh, examples of a couple regions that look like they had reverted back to the wild type. Um, but we also found additional clonal somatic mutations. And so a mutation in this gene, um, which is not clear if it's contributing to the pathogenesis, um, but uh, there are mutations uh, present in these samples that are, are likely contributing to the pathogenesis of this and, and the other diseases I talked about. Um, but just to uh, switch back quickly with the last part, um, you know, we continue as we age, you know, beyond just development to acquire copying errors. Um, and that's, you know, never more evident than in cancer. Um, and as an oncologist, we see this all the time. So you go from one cell, you know, to hundreds of billions of cells, and you imagine all just the copying errors that are occurring there. <clears throat> but we really want to ask kind of fundamental questions we haven't been able to ask. So how many mutations are there in each cell? How much does it vary between cells? What's a clone? It is just having different mutations. Does that make you a clone? Does it, is it functional? Um, how many drug-resistant clones are there when we start out? Can we identify those? Well, those would be the ones we really care about. Um, and then how is chemotherapy contributing to the problem? So it's mutagenic. Is it, in some cases, you know, hurting, driving the evolution, um, even though it may be killing some of the cells? And so just to give you an example of the genetic variation we can see um, in our ALL patients. So this is an ALL patient. <clears throat> had bulk sequencing, a bone merit diagnosis, and after four weeks of treatment, you can see two JAK2 variants were detected, um, but were then not detected in the remission sample. Um, and then we can see a clonal copy number change here that's very clear, and then it looks like a subclonal copy change here. So these are all the chromosomes, and then this would be two copies. This is gain or loss. Um, but we don't see either of those in the remission sample. Um, and so we just took single cells from the remission sample that we thought were leukemia, um, and we sorted them, amplified them, and then sequenced them. And so when we go back to that same sample, those rare cells, now we can identify almost all of them uh, have one of the two JAK2 mutations. Um, we can identify new mutations we didn't see in the original diagnostic sample that we think may be helping them survive. Um, and then we see a whole range of copy numbers. So they all share this clonal one that we saw. So that was clearly the early initiating event. Um, but then we just see a whole range of different copy number variation. Um, and so we're integrating that data uh, both. So these are uh, mutations. These are cells. Um, these are copy number changes. This is marker expression. And so we can see, again, the clonal copy number change, this copy number alteration. Uh, correlates with this. This copy number uh, variation is associated with this clone. Um, we see a couple new mutations, again, that are new clones that are popping up or were selected for. Um, and so uh, we're working now to develop really computational framework uh, with Dan Landau's group um, at the New York Genome Center to really ask, you know, you have this tree of, of uh, heritability, but what things are in inherited down the, tr uh, down the tree and what things are really plastic? And so really trying to provide a computational framework for really for understanding, um, you know, what, how did the disease evolve between that initial diagnosis and treatment, and really what are the features that are both static or heritable versus those that are plastic as we think about things that could be used as, for example, diagnostics or, or drug targets. 
So in conclusion, uh, I, the, the points I was trying to make are that our genomes are not static, but are really evolving at largely unknown rates. So we really haven't made many uh, measurements. Um, PTA is a novel method that uniquely enables um, both basic and translational research. Um, and we're just starting to identify opportunities where it's uniquely enabling in the clinical setting. Um, another area I haven't had time to talk about is looking at fine needle aspirate samples and being able to pick cells and, and sequence them. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, where our lab has gone some sense then um, is that really thinking about the cell as an encapsulation of, you know, all these molecules that, that direct the biology. And so both the genome, the transcriptome, the epigenome. And so we've invented a method for looking at the genome and transcriptome in the same cell. Um, we've also uh, have an early uh, method working to be able to add sparse methylation sequencing. Um, and so I think really, you know, defining cell states based on multiple measurements is, is going to define, um, you know, disease-associated phenotypes rather than one, you know, molecule or the other. And then lastly, there are many other applications. Anytime you have a tiny amount of DNA, um, we've even, we've been working with the um, Joint uh, Genome Institute at the Department of Energy. We can sequence single microbes much more accurately. Um, we can be looking at part of the NIST consortium, looking at um, off-target genome editing, um, a number of other things, forensics, ma ma many other things um, where amplifying teeny amounts of DNA could be useful. And so with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge everyone that, that contributed to the work and, and happy to take questions. Great talk. We'll uh, start with Tony. Oh, great, Chuck, great talk. Um, um, how processive is the um, application? Can you do long reads for uh, spice variants and that sort of thing as well? Yeah. So the RNA part um, is just typical right. RNA. So you can look at spice variants. The DNA part, um, the way we've approached it, the, the um, amplicons are shorter. So they're, you know, between 500 and 2,500 base pairs. Right. Um, there are issues with chimeras anytime you do amplification. So, and, and it, we've seen it's especially worse in the longer amplicons. Yeah. Um, but uh, we we're, we have an element sequencer where you can actually put insert sizes up to 1,500 base pairs. Um, so we're working with that, and then um, we've worked a little with a little with PacBio, but I think that's definitely an area where it could be could be useful. To get longer, it gets snip. Yeah, yeah. So if you could if you could do phasing right. of, of single cell right. genomes and and. Also, that helps. Uh, didn't have time to talk about it, but we've worked with Peter Park's lab at uh, Harvard, um, who's developed a method for phasing. So, if you can phase the frequency of, of a neighboring germline SNP, right. and it's the same frequency, then you can get rid of false positives. Right. Um, so, yeah, long reads could, could be helpful. I have a question. Um, so as you mentioned, the genome is very not static. And I imagine, you know, on an embryo level, it's probably the least static of any <clears throat> cell that we can imagine. And as we do um, pre-implantation testing, we're seeing that the one cell that people are taking from embryos is not necessarily always representative of the, of the embryo in itself. How, you know, that seems like it would be a barrier if you're looking at things on the single nucleotide level as well associated with mortality, morbidity. You know, how many cells are you thinking we will ultimately need to get a good representation of an embryo? <clears throat> yeah, so I think it's a good question. I mean, I've learned quite a bit about this by doing some work in the area. Most of the stability that we've seen, at least, and we've looked at single nucleotide variants, so taking two different biopsies mm -hmm. from a research embryo. Um, so we haven't seen so much in the small variant side, even doing whole genome sequencing. But mosaicism, aneuploidy mosaicism, is quite common. Yeah. And so, and it's actually a very controversial area in the field because it, it, some people think it corrects itself. Um, but uh, I think it's a fair point that, you know, it's not a perfect test if you're looking for aneuploidy and, and you know, there are going to be some things that are missed from, from sampling. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, I think some of the studies are, refer it's definitely a controversial area. And even here at Stanford, we have the TAME study with the transfer of aneuploid and mosaic embryos and kind of seeing what the outcomes are. And I think. All of that is very fascinating. Yeah. This is really short, simple question. Mm -hmm. And that just is, when you use the um, material you got from the end of the probes, 
and then you showed us that there were what you saw in terms of single cell genomic variation. Mm -hmm. um, but did you did you <laughs> define which were neurons and which were not, or did that matter? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> in the current study, we use NUN, which is a marker for neurons, but it does also mark glia. Um, so they could have been glial cells. Um, the next version of what we're doing um, is doing DNA and RNA in the same cell. So then you get a really good definition of what the cell is and, you know, what the genetic variation was. Yeah. I have a question. Does the amplification method work if your DNA is fragmented and it becomes, like, very, you know, very small amounts of fragmented DNA, yeah. like a few hundred base pairs? So uh, the way the DNA and RNA protocol works is we take advantage that it doesn't work well in small fragments. And so when you make cDNA, it's on the smaller side, and so it actually doesn't amplify very well, so we can do one-pot amplification. Um, but we are working. We have a, some preliminary data that we have a strategy for getting small fragments, so even down to cell-free DNA size um, amplifying, so things like ancient DNA or FFPE or other things I think people care a lot about. Um, but uh, we're still working on getting that working, but I, I think what we're trying looks promising. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I have two mics going here, so hold on. Okay. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Roxana Donishu. Uh, she is an assistant professor of biomedical data science and dermatology here at Stanford. She is currently assistant director of the Center of Excellence for Precision Health in Pharmacogenetics, director of informatics at the Stanford Skin Innovation and Intervention Research Group, a founding member of Translational AI and Dermatology, and involved in numerous other initiatives here on campus. Her talk today is on pharmacogenetics and maternal child health. have to believe that I know a thing or two about maternal health right now being 30 weeks pregnant and exceedingly uncomfortable. Unfortunately, I don't think any of these technologies are going to help with my discomfort. Um, so those of you who have may have heard me talk before know that a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is actually in artificial intelligence, large language models, computer vision. Um, but when I was doing my PhD, I actually did a lot of work in pharmacogenomics, and I've come back to that now. I'm working with um, Dr. Terry Klein, who is the director of um, the pharmacogenomics knowledge base, and we've been talking about how to leverage the latest and greatest AI tools to improve um, large medical knowledge bases. And today, what I would like to do is just give a quick overview of some of the things we're thinking, but also talk about a new initiative within PharmGKB to really put pediatric pharmacogenomics um, at center stage. So just a basic over uh, definition. So pharmacogenomics is looking at how human genetic variation impacts drug response. That could be something from what dose of a drug you need for it to be effective, or are you at high risk for a bad um, outcome from taking that medication? And I want to give you a little vignette. I remember when I read this case report for the first time, and I found it to be just one of those very heartbreaking case reports that just sticks with you. And, and even though I read it over a decade ago when I was putting up this talk together, I said, okay, I have to talk about this case. So there's a postpartum mom that's prescribed codeine and um, other pain medications for her postpartum pain. And then at day 30, she no noticed that her infant is a little bit lethargic. I'm not really, eat, you know, drinking the breast milk, but but nothing has changed. And what happens is actually at day 13, her breastfed, perfectly healthy baby passes away. And um, she had stored some of the breast milk aside because the baby was not eating. And they found that the breast milk had four times the expected amount of morphine. So what happened here? And so this is actually from the 
Farm GKB website, this is looking at uh, the met, met metabolism pathway of uh, codeine and all of the all of the blue ovals represent the different genes that are involved in the breakdown and activation of this medication. So codeine is actually a prodrug and it is metabolized by CYP2D6 to the active uh, product of morphine. And some percentage of the population are ultra metabolizers. And that's what this mom was. She was an ultra metabolizer of codeine. So even though she was taking a perfectly normal, acceptable dose, was not taking too much, her body was converting that codeine to the morphine very quickly, causing her breast milk to have a fatal amount of morphine for her baby. And, I mean, this also happens amongst adults, too. You can imagine if somebody gets codeine they, and they, it ends up being too high a dose of morphine, you can get respiratory depression, all sorts of things. This is a problem because depending on the population, there are certain populations that have up to a population frequency of 11% of ultra metabolizers. And this is just an example of one drug and one gene. There are many gene drug associations that um, occur that we need to worry about. And that's sort of what our uh, Center for Excellence for Personalized Precision Health and Pharmacogenomics has been thinking about. How do we actually try to implement um, the testing of the most sort of high risk things? So in this paper, uh, which was written in 2006, and costs of things have clearly changed since 2006, they talk about different clinical strategies to ma manage, you know, breastfeeding while on co coding. Some, one of the ideas was, okay, can we, we just avoid it altogether? Um, you know, but, uh, you know, that could affect what your pain management strategy is, um, Another option is to actually genotype the mom and know like whether it's safe for her to take. You know, that would be our preferred strategy. Um, but what ended up actually happening is that, you know, it was basically said no more codeine for breastfeeding moms and for children. Um, so Farm GKB is this knowledge base that basically catalogs all the evidence we have on human genetic variation that can impact drug response phenotypes. And so any of you could go on the website today and look at, you know, if you actually know genotypes of your patients, look at what the recommendations are for different drugs. If you're looking at prescribing a drug, look at what the possible genetic variants are. Are there FDA labels for that medication already in existence? Um, and now we have added this new portal specifically focused on pediatric recommendations and pediatric pharmacogenomics. So just kind of dialing in on like what the pedi pediatric dashboard looks like because guidelines are different. We know that children are not just small adults. All the pediatricians definitely know that. Um, so basically this includes guidelines that are specific to um, pediatric populations, drugs that uh, might be used more often in pediatric populations with labels that include important uh, genetic information that you might need to use for your patients. These annotations, this just gives you kind of an example, uh, just kind of shows you a breakdown. Um, th for example, there are 56 pediatric CPIC guidelines. CPIC is the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium. It's a consortium of both clinicians and researchers that look at all the existing evidence on gene drug associations and then write specific guidelines on how, what is the clinical impact and what changes do you need to make if you know that, you know, a genetic variant is in your patient or alternatively gives you some guidance if you're thinking about, oh, do I need to test my patient before I give this um, particular medication? So all of this is, uh, this dashboard is already live. It's already available. Anybody can um, look at it. And I just want to kind of give you 
a couple different examples of, you know, just what it kind of looks like here. So for example, um, it'll tell you about the pediatric recommendations if you need to use allopurinol. And it'll even give you examples of alternative, um, you know, gu guide alternative drugs you might want to consider uh, if you're not able to do genetic testing. But as we know, as genetic testing gets cheaper and cheaper, and I'm in particular with the um, the plans for our our uh, center for excellence to try to actually look at what the costs would be to start actually genotyping patients that might be at high risk for having gene drug associations. I think that we're going to see over the next decade or two things change. And now we do actually have, you know, guidelines in place to help inform us um, when we're making those um, drug selections, those uh, dosage selections so that we can do this safely for our pediatric population. So I just want to talk a little bit about what's coming down the pipeline in the future. It's not to the point that I'm ready to share what we're building, but it's what we're building right now. And you may wonder where does this information all come from? Like this is a huge knowledge base that's been created over a period of years. So it actually involves an expert team of scientist curators that scour the scientific literature to extract relevant, con uh, you know, relevant content. And the process can take many, many hours. And I've worked side by side with the curators. We've looked at the research papers. And we've essentially, you know, have now hundreds to thousands of examples of research papers that they've read and the relevant information that they've extracted from these papers as human curators. And I'm just curious if anyone's heard of ChatGPT. Raise your hand if you've heard of ChatGPT. Yeah, pretty much everybody. So what we've been doing is essentially these large language models are trained on large corpuses of text data. And they become really good the first level of training for these is almost like a fancy autocomplete. And from there, they get an additional uh, training that happens from human reinf uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, where they get kind of a feedback from humans that interact with them. But in general, like the out-of-the-box models are not trained for biomedical context, except for certain proprietary ones, such as Google's MedPalm, and we have actually been in conversation with them. Um, we have also additionally actually began training our own large language models, taking base models, and then fine tuning them to be able to understand and parse the biomedical literature. Not only to be able to understand and parse the medical literature, but to be able to extract important relationships within the biomedical literature. So now you can imagine that instead of having a human curator who has to go read this entire paper and then look at the supplement and try to weed out all of the relevant information, by having actually trained these models to know what kind of information is relevant from research papers, we can actually leverage these models as decision support tools. You still have the human curator to check that everything is correct, but now they have this tool in their toolbox that can help highlight and pinpoint exactly the areas that they need to look into to be able to extract that information. And given the large volume of literature that's coming out every day in genomics, and particularly pharmacogenomics, that helps us keep up and keep our knowledge to be the most um, relevant and latest information that exists. So. That is currently where we're all at now, which is a very exciting time for us. And I just want to thank the team. Um, Dr. Terry Klein is the principal investigator, and um, Dr. Michelle World Carrillo is also another one of the principal in investigators and the directors. And I've been working sort of as the informatics and AI um, collaborator in this space. Happy to take any questions. Very exciting work. Uh, I have concerns 
uh, about the chat GTP type approaches. Uh, one, you don't know the databases that they are using. You don't know how frequently they're updated. Uh, we are concerned yeah. about hallucinations uh, in the databases. And uh, if they're not updated every day, then you're not using up-to-date information. So how are you dealing with those potential shortcomings? So we're not using chat GPT for this large language models. So I, I'm glad you brought all this up because we have actually a big paper coming out tomorrow ah. specifically on bias and racism in, in algorithms and inaccuracies. So very well aware of these issues. And that's actually one of the reasons that, one, we are... Um, we are basically fine tuning our own models where we're giving it ground truth biomedical literature to learn from the literature and what the literature looks like. That's one. And two, there are now new setups um, uh, called retrieval augmentation where basically when you ask the language model to do something, you actually give it a corpus of, hey, you can only you use whatever your you know parameters you're trained on but you need to actually retrieve the information we want from this particular corpus that we've approved. So in this case, it could be any paper that says pharmacogenomics. And then it'll actually, you can actually um, see exactly, can also tell you exactly where in that research paper it's pulling that information off. So that deals with hallucinations because you actually have uh, provenance of where that information is coming from. And that's kind of what we want to do because the human curators still need to substantiate that these associations are correct. But what will help them a lot is if instead of having to read in the entire paper, they can say, oh, I need to look in these spaces and it'll have the information that I need. Thank you. Uh, Roxana Carlswester, thanks for bringing our attention back to a fabulous resource, PharmGKB. We've looked at it for a couple of years in trying to understand its utility in looking for drug sensitivities in newborns where obviously a lot of pharmacology is understudied. The question I have is because a lot of these drug metabolizing enzymes are kind of promiscuous, CYPT26, used by a whole host of common medications, is there any utility in looking at like common use substances like caffeine, which people ingest all the time, don't consider it a medication, that might share a metabolizing enzyme and give you... Um, some ins insight as to whether that would affect the metabolism of the drug, or are, even though the enzyme is the same, the, the actions on different medications are, the kinetics yeah. of it are quite different. Is there anything known about that? I mean, I think actually one of the um, points, just to kind of piggyback on what you said, polypharmacology is a huge problem. And like, that's, I think, one of the most you know, high risk situations for things going wrong. And of course there are, for different enzymes, there's also assays that directly look like, and look at enzyme activity in addition to genotyping, um, because obviously uh, genotyping is one thing, but also how is the gene express is an issue. It's funny you brought up caffeine because I'm actually a caffeine slow metabolizer and I cannot drink it because it makes me so sick. But um but yeah, there is, I think they are very promiscuous. And I think what we, what has been done at PharmGKB is to try to actually look at what the clinical evidence is, is like, where has there actually been trials to say like, hey, because some of these genetic mutations maybe don't have as big of an impact, but to actually give through the CPIC guidelines, um, a grade to the recommendation. Like this is like a well-supported recommendation with trial data supporting that, hey, there's actually really bad outcomes versus other associations don't have as strong of evidence. And of course now FDA has decided in some cases to actually put labels on some drugs because they're such strong evidence. Yeah, great. So while we're waiting to build the clinical evidence and totally agree that that's much needed, we're interested in, maybe we'll come and talk to you offline, is around yeah. building a clinical phenot a phenotype of the drug, meaning because the genotypes are not always expressed or they're expressed variable, and looking at either molecules or medications that you can gain insights to about what I you're see. worried about. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. It's like, okay, if somebody has a bad reaction to this, this gives you, you a, this gives you insight that, okay, we need to, you know, they might be sensitive to, a, they might a be sensitive to another. Yeah. So yeah. like the fact, you know, the fact that that mom had such a bad outcome with 2D6 before they knew she was an ultra metabolizer. Now, even without genetic testing, it should have given insight that, okay, we need to avoid other 2D6. I think that's a very excellent point, especially in the day of, um, 
that maybe we don't have genotyping on everyone. Yeah, I'd right. love to talk about that. Right. I'm sure we yeah. could leverage EMR for that as yeah. well. Yeah, working on that as well. We'll share yeah. some cool insights with you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful chat. While slides are being loaded, okay. <laughs> um, please um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Steve Quake, the Lee Otterson Professor of Bioengineering, Professor of Applied Physics at Stanford, and co-president of Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. He has invented many human biology measurement tools, including DNA sequencing technologies and micro microfluidic automation processes. He's also invented diagnostic tools, such as the first non-invasive prenatal test for Down syndrome and other chromosomal aneuploidies, paving the way for replacement of invasive procedures with safer and more accessible technologies, which I think from a diversity and equity standpoint is extremely important in our field. Today's talk is on liquid biopsies, a path to creating health equity in the genomic revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to see you all again and be among friends here. I'm going to tell you a story that goes back almost a decade and a half, and so we'll try to get through it at about one year per minute in the talk here. Um, uh, first, uh, conflicts of interest, as a very wise university president once said, no conflict, no interest. Um, <clears throat> we've got the, I've got the slides marked where they're relevant here going forward. Um, so the thesis of the talk is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and it's that uh, you know, very few people have access to tertiary care facilities like Stanford or UCSF with very skilled physicians who can do uh, invasive biopsies which require a fair amount of skill. Um, however, blood can be drawn anywhere and shipped through the mail. And uh, uh, I'm gonna tell you about a number of such blood tests that are now being performed um, and uh, across a variety of fields, many of which are relevant for kids and, and expectant moms, um, and some of which are, many of which are saving lives. Um, and uh, this is, you know, I think really important from the equity perspective because uh, there's just an access question. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of complaints in the literature about how the fruits of the genome revolution have benefited a very small number of people. And this is, for me, a way that is really uh, extending the reach of those benefits and sharing them across a very uh, uh, broad set of folks, um, especially in rural, underdeveloped areas. So the whole, the whole bit of what follows, uh, the substance of the talk, um, depends on this phenomenon, which was discovered in the late 1940s by two Frenchmen working in, uh, uh, in Strasbourg, Mandel Marseille. And they discovered uh, that there's DNA and RNA uh, floating around in the blood. And this is not DNA in its privileged position of being the genome and the nucleus of a cell, of an intact cell. This is the detritus of dead cells, um, which have uh, died, spilled their guts into the bloodstream. The genome gets chewed up in little pieces, and it circulates around. Um, and it's worth noting that this was discovered in 1948 uh, when people uh, Oswald Avery had, I think, just shown that DNA is the molecule of inheritance, uh, but no, very few people had read it, even fewer believed it. And for these guys, this was just blood chemistry. Um, and you can see in their paper here that they, uh, I don't know if I've got a pointer here, um, they looked at uh, a variety of patients, some normal, some had different afflictions, two were pregnant. And they noted in the text that in the case of pregnancy, the value seemed a little bit higher um, of nucleic acids. And it was that was just remarked upon, and didn't, they didn't really understand why. And it took another half century before that was figured out. Um, and in Oxford, Jim Wainscote, Dennis Lowe, a bunch of other folks uh, had decided to revisit this question and use the techniques of molecular biology, which had been invented in the interim. And in 97, uh, they used PCR to show that uh, women who had male fetuses also had the male sex chromosome, the Y chromosome, fragments of it in their blood. So that's cell-free DNA. Some of it was coming from the baby or the fetus. And that opened the question of, OK, is there a way to make a non-invasive test to look at the genetics of the fetus, and in particular, to replace amniocentesis? And people spent a decade trying to work that out, tried many things that didn't work. Um, you know, there were all these attempts to try to find biochemical differences between the fetal and the maternal DNA and do purifications, things like that. None of that worked. 
Um, we eventually cracked the problem here at Stanford um, through a terrific collaborative effort with uh, uh, Yair Blumenfeld, uh, Usha Chikar, Luann Hudgens, and my student, Christina Fan, and figured out that the way to do this was not to try to differentiate between maternal and fetal DNA, but rather to count molecules and look for overrepresentation of one chromosome relative to, an, to the remainder of, of the chromosomes. And that's because uh, the vast majority of things you're interested in with amniocentesis are aneuploidies or extra copies of chromosomes. And so even though the fetal DNA is just a, a small fraction of what's there, it's maybe a percent or so at the relevant time in pregnancy, um, that small overrepresentation can be measured with as good precision as you like simply by counting high enough. And there's a very nice statistical argument behind that. And we counted these molecules a variety of different ways. The most successful and popular has been using next generation sequencers as molecular counters. Um, and that was our paper in 2008. And that really kind of opened the field up for everybody. Um, very quickly, multiple clinical trials were launched. And within four years, um, there were commercial diagnostics using this approach. And it was taken up very, very quickly. Uh, by 2019, 8 million women a year getting some version of the test. If you imagine they're all avoiding amniocentesis, that amounts to thousands of lives saved every year. Um, given the choice, women were choosing this over amniocentesis. The rates were plunging by huge amounts when, uh, in, in a very interesting study that uh, was done. And uh, it sort of swept through. I'd say by now probably 50 million women in the world have had one version or another of this test. So that was pretty neat. Um, and uh, it turns out this counting principle has many other applications. Um, in diagnostics and in the use of cell-free DNA. And we uh, began using it not just to count chromosomes, but to count smaller parts of the genome to look at copy number and structural variant, copy number changes and structural variation. And then even down to counting alleles, individual alleles. So you could do that to call individual mutations and polymorphisms. And so therefore, you can get essentially anything, any question you have about the fetal genome, you can answer it non-invasively. And we published that a few years later. When the first paper came out, um, I got a call from Hannah Valentine, who's in cardiology here, um, and she said, hey, when we do heart transplants, um, we have a similar sort of problem. Uh, we go and we biopsy this individual after their transplant every few months to see if rejection is happening, and it's, uh, it's painful, patients don't like it, it's not a great diagnostic. Is there a way to use um, the cell-free DNA to, to replace that? Um, and so uh, we began to think about it and realized that the heart transplant is like a genome transplant. Every cell in that heart has a donor's genome and is different than the genome of the recipient. And so uh, if you monitor the polymorphisms in the blood, you can look for donor polymorphisms, and that should tell you something about how many cells are dying in that heart. If the immune system is attacking the heart, cells are dying, it's rejecting, more DNA should go in the blood. And we were able to show that was so. So Tom Snyder, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time, worked with a bunch of archival samples Hannah had. These here show uh, five different patients post-transplant, the axis, the x-axis is months post-transplant, the y-axis is amount of donor polymorphism shown by the blue line, don't worry about the green one, that's a technical measurement. And at every single time point here, the patients were physically biopsied, the pathologist looked at it and said rejecting or not rejecting. The places the pathologist called rejecting are shown with red arrows, um, and you can see that um, there's a very evident sort of increase in, uh, in donor DNA at the moment of rejection. And in fact, it's increasing even before the pathologist can see rejection. So that got us very excited. And we called it universal detection because there's nothing here that's particular to heart biology. So this should work with any solid organ transplant, right? And then we decided to try to do that. Um, we wrote a grant together uh, and uh, did a sort of larger scale prospective study. Pretty much every heart and lung transplant patient at Stanford was recruited to the study over a period of three years. In the middle of it, Hannah left for a while. She went to take a leadership role at NIH. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, um, sorry, blanking on the name right now. Um, help me out here. Thank you. Kiran Kush took over <coughs> as, uh, as, the, as the lead uh, for the study. And uh, you can see there in our cohort, uh, a third of them were pediatric, um, some of them very young kids. I mean, it's amazing how young they're doing transplants for some of these kids. Um, and it worked really well. Uh, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, it very interesting ways to compare to the invasive thing. But pretty much in all respects, um, the, we were able to prove liquid biopsy was superior. Same thing happened with the lung case. Um, and here, uh, Dave Weil, Mark Nichols, Dave Cornfield. 
Um, and the level of cell-free DNA in these lung transplants was correlated with all sorts of measures of lung dysfunction, including rejection, but many other things as well. Um, so uh, that valley, it wasn't heart specific. So this was licensed to a company called CareDX. Um, they uh, did their own studies. They extended to kidney transplantations, reimbursed by Medicare. There's now hundreds of thousands of these tests done every year. Um, and it's really changed the way transplant care is done. Um, that's pretty awesome to see. Um, while we were doing that study, the postdoc in my lab, Ewan de Vlamink, shown here, um, came to me and said, you know, not all the DNA is human, like 97, 98% of it's mapping to the human genome. And I said, that's nice. That means we don't have a lot of contamination. Go finish the study, please. Um, but fortunately, he didn't listen to me. He got really curious about that 2%, uh, went and looked at it, decided it wasn't technical artifact, and in fact was truly non-human DNA from the microbiomes of these individuals. And we realized that we were kind of for free getting a measurement of the microbiome of these individuals um, and realized that, oh, wow, this is a very interesting cohort to study because they've just had a harder lung transplant, so they're on immunosuppressive drugs, and their immune system is essentially being turned down. We could ask what happens to the microbiome um, then. And it changes dramatically. So this is now uh, 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 several different viral species um, shown uh, over time. This is the average over many patients. And you can see that uh, the anella viruses are just exploding as the, uh, as the immunosuppression is cranked up. And then they go down as the immunosuppression is tapered a bit. Um, so something very interesting is happening to your, uh, in the way these viruses interact with the immune system. The, the sort of the canary in the coal mine appears to be these anella viruses. And because it's so important to get the level of immunosuppression correct, uh, the doctors, they track the levels very carefully, both of the immunosuppressant and an antiviral drugs. So you could look at how the microbiome changed with the levels of these drugs. And in any way you look at it, when you're turning down the immune system or eliminating other viral competitors, the uh, anella virus has just become a bigger part of the pie. Um, and shown on the bottom are healthy non-transplanted people and people one day after transplant from the study. So we realized this also had practical use because it's sort of a hypothesis-free way to look for pathogens and infectious disease, which is, of course, a huge source of, uh, of death in the world. Um, and uh, you know, diagnostics, um, there's still many diagnostic challenges in that field, let's leave it that way. So this was licensed to a company called Carius. They developed a clinical test looking at giving you answers of over 1,000 potential uh, microorganisms from a single blood draw. They do it over the turn answer in a day. Um, and it's been sort of remarkable to see. Um, they, you know, are now, I don't know, doing tens of thousands of tests a year. There's lots of interesting clinical evidence accumulating. Uh, this was a small study done early on at the Rady. Again, pediatric pneumonia. And, you know, the, the fraction of patients diagnosed were substantially larger um, with this test. And it would, in many cases, suggest changing antibiotic treatment. This guy, who you just heard from, when he was at St. Jude's, um, his day job is treating young kids with cancer. And infectious disease is a huge problem with blood cancers because the kids are immunosuppressed. Um, did a very nice study showing that uh, the cell-free DNA was detecting um, pathogens uh, up to three days earlier than standard of care. Most, I mean, last week, I think it was, um, a larger study just published, prospective, uh, in adults, this one, um, showing uh, pretty, again, pretty dramatic effects compared to standard of care. So it's been great to see that sort of take off into the world. Um, again, sort of back at Stanford, uh, we returned to one of our favorite systems, human development and pregnancy, and got interested in this question of, is it possible to sort of monitor the, the gene expression program of human development non-invasively? Um, and uh, this was something we did with Gary Shaw and Dave Stevenson and also with Mads Melby uh, under the auspices of the March of Dimes from Maturity Center. And Tweedy Go and Mir Mufraj and my group played an important role in this. And how do you go about this? DNA is not that instructive um, for how your phenotype changes. Um, the answer lay back in that Mandel Matthijs paper in 1948 because they discovered not just cell-free DNA but cell-free RNA. Um, here's their data again. The, uh, uh, the second column uh, of data there is, is, is ribonucleic acid, and wow, amazing. The field had more or less forgotten about that. Uh, most people were studying DNA. Um, we went and decided to do a full-on omics study and realized that there's a lot of phenotypic information about 
your health state at that moment because every tissue is contributing RNA into the blood. So we decided to try to see if we could monitor human development. Mads and his colleagues in Denmark recruited a bunch of very brave women who agreed to give blood every week during their pregnancy, so super high-density sampling. Um, here you can see it. Uh, each row is a different woman. Uh, each square is a moment when they gave blood, and the uh, upside-down triangles when they gave birth. So just amazing sort of resource. We uh, did our, our measurements on that using a large PCR panel, qPCR panel, and you can see genes from the immune system, from the placenta, from fetal tissues, uh, fetal spe tissue-specific genes, and they're changing very dramatically over the course of pregnancy. And so uh, many of these uh, sort of going up uh, after delivery, uh, placenta-related things go down to zero, um, dramatic changes, and all that together is giving a very interesting, intricate picture of, of what's happening during development. In particular, what's the gestational age of the baby? So we began building models to try to predict, whoops, gestational age just from uh, just from the RNA measurements, and we're able to do that um, reasonably well and got to the point where we got to believe it could approach the performance of ultrasound, which is sort of standard of care here. And you'd be surprised how many women, both in the U.S. and worldwide, either don't have access to ultrasound or miss the window, because ultrasound really only has good precision in a very narrow window in pregnancy. If you miss it, you don't know when to predict delivery, and that ends up having many important health consequences. So... A molecular clock for gestational age, it was pretty neat and, a, and I think a fun consequence of this work. Um, but the really big problem um, is what happens when the clock is, is wrong or you're not following the clock, um, particular premature birth. Um, and this ends up being just an enormous, enormous um, health burden. These aneuploidies we talked about earlier, that's like a half a percent to one percent of pregnancies. This is close to 10 percent. Um, and it's the single largest cause of neonatal death and complications later in life. And there's been no meaningful diagnostic to understand who's at risk. So we thought, all right, cell-free DNA should be telling us something when things go wrong. This required another different cohort. So Gary and Dave were great, went out sort of beating the bushes for people who had been collecting samples, uh, connected us with Mikhail Elevitz at Penn, who had this cohort with very early um, uh, preterm delivery. And you can see the upside-down triangles there. Um, in, the, in the sort of mid-20th week. Um, and small numbers, but, you know, a very unusual and precious cohort. Similarly, Joe Biggio in uh, Alabama had, uh, had a cohort with, with early delivery, and we used both of those um, to uh, do, in this case, RNA-seq, looking for a gene discovery of what might be associated with preterm birth. And by comparing that with the, uh, those two, as well as the, uh, the Danish cohort, which was all full-term delivery, we found a set of genes that were clearly elevated in the preterm cases, not in the normal. Um, it was small numbers of patients, ethnically homogeneous cohorts, all kinds of problems, but we convinced ourselves there's enough signal there, there's something real. Um, and in fact, you were getting the signal up to two months in advance of delivery. So that, you know, we published that and said, all right, we think there's something here. You need to do a lot more work before you understand if there's a practical diagnostic in the offing, but, you know, you should go do that. Um, and so uh, we and others did. Um, we decided to turn our attention to preeclampsia, which is a major cause of preterm birth, and look at that specifically. Um, larger cohort, again, retrospective with a bunch of collaborators, um, close to 200 patients. Uh, and here we were able to find uh, a larger group of genes. The effect sizes are not big for any given gene, but collectively they're actually reasonable, area under the curve, about 0.72. We had two separate validation cohorts, reasonable ethnic diversity in this case across uh, the cohorts, um, and getting a signal you know, earlier in the, around the 16th week or earlier that people were at risk. So that's a promising sign. Uh, Mirvi, which is the company that licensed the technology and, uh, and uh, has been trying to develop a practical clinical diagnostic, also did work on preeclampsia. They put together a cohort of nearly 2,000 patients. Um, we're able to find panel even better power in that one, AUCs of close to 0.8. They're now in the middle of a 10,000-woman trial, prospective, which should wrap up early next year, and then we're really going to know whether or not this is uh, going to work. Um, I'll come back to this question of, you know, what's the role of ethnicity in all this? They, because of their large cohort, were able to show that, for example, the molecular clock made with their day, the gestational age, was completely independent of ethnicity, which is an awesome property of this, um, that, you know, that the underlying 
molecular forces that drive both development and preeclampsia seem to be uh, shared across all women, which makes for a very, hopefully, practical diagnostic. So I'll wrap up there. Um, we turn to the sort of the thesis of the talk, that these simple blood tests, which can be formed anywhere, are saving lives. They're replacing invasive biopsies, which require the presence of a skilled physician, and we're hoping to see this have many other applications in uh, pregnancy, human development, human disease. Ah, the baby I showed you. I forgot to mention that. Um, the little baby in the incubator on the, on the preterm. That's my daughter. She was born a month early preterm, spent her first night in the incubator, and so I had personal interest in this. That's her now. She grew up just fine, and uh, it's amazing what biology can do. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. So, yeah, motion from population health. So I'm thinking about the RNA, that generally RNA is degre degraded very easily, and especially both, both technically and handling the blood compared to the DNA. Give, give us some thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, why would you use RNA? It's such a labile thing. You look at it the wrong way on your bench, and it gets degraded. Um, it turns out that this RNA that survives in the blood has been protected somehow. Some of it is in little endosomes, some of it is uh, on protein particles and things like that. And so um, it's much more robust than pure RNA um, in the absence of, of anything protecting it. And it's amazing. I mean, we've been able to dig back into people's freezers where they banked plasma years ago, no idea that they were wanting to preserve RNA, and so nothing special done. But you can get you know, an amazing amount of RNA out of these samples. It's been very impressive to me. Steve, that, that was just a tour de force, um, really amazing, and, and congratulations for what you've done for medicine. Question about other um, fluids, like uh, saliva, urine, um, what's in there, how diagnostic can it be, um, or you know, is blood special? Yeah, so urine is one that we've been quite interested in. I have a student right now who's been analyzing sulfury RNA in urine, and very interesting signatures there, especially comparing it to the blood, about which tissues are the dominant right. contributors. And not surprising, it's things like bladder and things like that. But many others in the urine as well. Um, kidneys, big one, of course. But um, it's, it's, I think, going to be very useful for certain things. Um, and obviously, in some ways, e easier to obtain than blood. But Harder to obtain it without, collect, without contamination. Yeah. Um, the collection there ends yeah. up being a little more complicated. Maybe there's room to innovate a device for that. Right. Yeah, I'll just ask a quick question. So have you thought much about integrating the single cell atlases and cell-free RNA, so getting a signature of a cell type in, in the blood rather than tissue at the tissue level? Absolutely. So we spent an enormous amount, the same student actually who, who doing the cell-free urine before that, she was working on a, on a project to deconvolve the cell-free RNA signature using cell atlases. So what I spent a lot of time doing the last five years is building atlases of the human body, uh, molecular definitions of all the cell types using single-cell transcriptomics. And you should be able to, in principle, use that to look at the RNA in the blood, which is the sum of many different transcriptomes together, and try and treat that as an inverse problem, try to write that cell-free transcriptome um, as the sum of all these different cell type transcriptomes. And you can write down mathematical approaches to do that and algorithms. And it turns out it works pretty well. Um, and so you can really deconvolve down to the level of cell type uh, what's going on in that, uh, in that blood sample. Any other questions? Well, I think that was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.